we're going to be using Responsive Prayer 1, page 282 in the Lutheran Service Book. Holy God, holy and most gracious Father, have mercy and hear us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. Lord, keep this nation under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. For our cry, we're going to be using Psalm 124. Psalm 124. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, If the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. But praise be to the Lord, who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our text for meditation today will be the first five verses of Job chapter 36. So this is beginning Elihu's fourth and final speech. Uh, this is going to be governing the last two chapters of Elihu's speech, so chapters 36, 37. So uh, this is going to be his longest speech and uh, primarily concerned with the whole gamut of, of apologetics for God, uh, basically defending God in front of Job, because uh, Elihu's original argument against Job, or, or his original uh, aggravation with Job leading to Elihu speaking up, was uh, that Job had defended himself and not God. So Elihu is the one who's speaking in order to defend God. But in order to do that, Elihu has to talk about who he is. And he, and he did that quite a bit in uh, chapter 32 and also somewhat in 33, where Elihu was talking about himself as a young man who is trying to wait patiently for his elders to speak because uh, if wisdom is attached with age, then uh, those who are elders should be allowed to speak first and allow their wisdom to go out first so that uh, the younger's, younger people may be corrected. But as Elihu pointed out then uh, in chapter 32, uh, when he first made his speech, uh, his, his opening speech, he was saying that, well, it's, it's not the age that gives wisdom, it's the Spirit of God. So Elihu, disappointed with Job for defending himself and not God, and also disappointed with the friends because the friends were accusing Job without evidence or, or following through on anything, uh, Elihu felt that it was up to him to speak, uh, speak on behalf of God and speak in the spirit of wisdom. So uh, Elihu was trying to uh, present himself as a young man, yet a wise man, not of himself, but of God and his spirit. So when we're looking at Elihu's speeches, Elihu is trying to, uh, trying to speak on behalf of God 
out of the revelation given to the people at that time. So uh, Job, the friends, and Elihu all have the same uh, revelation given to them through, well, they, they talk a lot about uh, natural means. And they talk about looking to the creation, and Elihu's going to get into that very deeply in, in chapter 36, 37 here. Uh, but they're also looking very much towards the revelation of God himself in history. So how has God revealed himself to various peoples uh, or various persons uh, in, in history? And for people at this time, there are a lot of offhand references to, to um, the first three chapters of Genesis. So not only the creation, but we also have uh, the state of humanity after the fall into sin. Uh, we also have the viewpoint of human beings being of the earth, very earthy, and that we will return to the dust. And those who are returning to the dust are themselves sinful. So uh, it's only by the grace of God that people go. Um, other than that, the, the, the uh, allusions to Genesis chapter 3, because Genesis half, chapter 3 is not written yet, because Moses writes Genesis, the book of Genesis, so there's no textual dependence of Job on Genesis. But we do find that uh, the themes are present. Um, so, uh, also, also connections to people of the past. You'd also have, say, uh, Abraham and uh, Esau. And, uh, well, actually, no, not, not Abraham. Abraham comes afterward. Sorry, yes, Abraham. <laughs> Abraham and Esau. Uh, because uh, some of these, some of the characters, so especially uh, Eliphaz, as the Temanite and also uh, Bildad the Shuhite, they're actually descendants of of uh, Abraham and his offspring. So uh, they also know that. So coming down from Abraham's time, you can assume that the people speaking in these dialogues are familiar with uh, the teachings of God in the first uh, thirty-two chapters of Genesis. So uh, Elihu would be appealing to the basics of God from that. But uh, Elihu would be trying to speak in the spirit of wisdom, trying to show that this is how we understand God. Now, the reason why I'm trying to build all that up is to show who Elihu is, because the first five verses, sorry, the first four verses, rather, in chapter 36 here, Elihu is going to be making some very grand statements about himself. So we need to know who he really is. So uh, let's, let's get into it. Job chapter 36, verses 1 to 4. Elihu continued, Bear with me a little longer, and I will show you, Job, that there is more to be said in God's behalf. I get my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe justice to my Maker. Be assured that my words are not false. One perfect in knowledge is with you. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, have mercy. So, <clears throat> if you caught that in, at the end there, the, the first four, the, uh, when Elijah is saying, my words are not false, and then he immediately goes, one perfect in knowledge is with you. Um, you might think, well, what's what's he really saying there? And uh, yeah, checking checking the Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew is not necessarily perfect. Uh, it, it, it's more along the lines of blameless or complete. But Elihu really is building himself up, and this is troubling because if we're if we're looking to what uh, Elihu was saying beforehand where he's talking about uh, this is this is in chapter 33 so Elihu when he shifts his speech after introducing himself into the dialogue in chapter 32 33 is when he's start starting to speak to Job specifically so that he can actually counsel Job and at the beginning of uh, 33 he's saying but now Job listen to my words pay attention to everything I say I am about to open my mouth. My words are on the tip of my tongue. My words come from an upright heart. My lips sincerely speak what I know. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Answer me then, if you can. Prepare yourself and confront me. I am just like you before God. I too have been taken from clay. 
No fear of me should alarm you, nor should my hand be heavy upon you. When Elihu is speaking here, um, he's trying to build a rapport with Job, trying to show that he and Job are the same. So Elihu was made by God. He's a, he's a creation of the Lord, creation of God's spirit. So is Job. <clears throat> Elihu was created by God in clay. That is the earthiness. Uh, I was referencing uh, the first few chapters of Genesis. Well, that's part of Genesis, is that human beings came from the dust. Adam was formed from the dust of the earth, so that uh, he is himself very earthy. In fact, uh, the name Adam means, well, earth, ground, soil. Uh, specifically, red soil. Because the reddened soil, um, uh, that, that's what's fruitful and will multiply. And that's what God created Adam to do, to be fruitful and multiply. So, um, what I was saying is taken from clay, and Job, taken from clay. They both have the same origins. God has made them through human beings, originally out of the dust. And the conclusion of this, that Elihu has in 33 verse 7, is, No fear of me should alarm you, nor should my hand be heavy upon you. So, Job can actually relax that there is a guy like him here. He's not, Elijah's not trying to build himself up to be greater than Job. But he's trying to show himself as somebody Job can relate to and somebody who's not trying to threaten Job. Uh, this is essential for counseling in that, or especially pastoral counseling, where you're trying to show that you're there for the benefit of the other person. Uh, you're not there to dominate them. You're not there to, to harm them. You're there as somebody just like them trying to sort through uh, all the problems that they're coming to you with. So Job coming to, or well, having the friends come to him, actually. Uh, Job is presenting his problems, the problem of suffering. Um, and the suffering specifically is actually uh, the perceived break in the relationship between God and Job. Because Job is wondering, well, what's going on with my faith? I believe in God. I want to come to God. But it seems to be a, a break, in the, break in the faith that he's not coming to me. Uh, so that's why, that's the origin of Job's suffering. So it's not necessarily that Job is focusing on the, um, on his lost children, on his failing marriage, on, on the state of his flesh that's, that's in disease. Uh, nor, nor the loss of his property or animals, and he doesn't have a way to make a, a living anymore. Uh, Job sees these things as, as definite problems. Like he spent uh, quite a lot of his speeches actually describing some of these things, but he, he's seen this all as a branching out from the original, um, the original break between him and, and God. So he's wondering, what, what about faith? So Elihu coming to him trying to sort through these things, trying to sort through that specific problem. Um, and this is not uncommon, because if you find somebody who is uh, in despair about, let's say, uh, their health, uh, failing health, um, and they're Christian, they might go, well, why does God allow this? Or, or they may be facing a period of mourning, and they're going, well, why has why God allowed that? Um, all of it is really stemming from a uh, perceived break between them and God because this horrible thing has happened, so they're wondering, well, ha is God punishing me for, for something? So, same with Job. Uh, Job relying on his blamelessness is very much confused. So Elihu is trying to come towards Job as uh, somebody sympathetic to him, but when Elihu shifts in this final argument. This is this is chapter thirty-six, where we're, the the text for meditation that we have, where he's saying, "Bear with me a little longer, and I will show you that there is more to be said in God's behalf." So we go, "Okay, well that makes sense." Elihu really does want to make a good, complete answer, so that no issue with this. This is what Job wants to wants to hear because he actually wants an answer. So good. Elihu says in verse three in chapter thirty-six. I get my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe justice to my maker. So he's saying, um, uh, 
Well, actually, um, for the NIVs, they're translating that in a different tense. You could say that um, Elihu is saying, I will get my knowledge from afar. And I would say that uh, that makes more sense in, with the second line when Elihu is also saying, I will ascribe justice. So I will get my knowledge from afar. And that also makes sense with the rest of the speech where Elihu is appealing to various things in the creation. This is where he's getting his knowledge. So yeah, he's getting his knowledge from afar. His knowledge is not of himself. His knowledge is from somewhere far off. And he's ascribing uh, justice, righteousness to, to his maker, the one who has made him so that he can actually get this, just, this uh, knowledge and, and bring it to himself. Now, this also makes sense because if we're talking about the source of righteousness, well, that has to be from God. Job will not argue this. He, like, he spent an entire uh, chapter, chapter 28, talking about wisdom relying on God. And uh, Job was speaking about that in terms of uh, the creation and also in terms of, of uh, justice. So um, as Job said, actually, let's just go to chapter 28, verse 28. Job said, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. So faith is wisdom. So proper living in faith, so the, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. So not doing evil is to actually understand. So uh, your knowledge or, and your wisdom is built around actively living out the faith. So if Elihu is saying, well, I ascribe righteousness to my Lord, well, that's where it's coming from. And he's saying, I get my knowledge from afar. Elihu is saying, my knowledge is not of myself, but it's of God. Uh, that makes sense. So Job will at least listen to this because he wants the knowledge of God. He wants the wisdom of God in this conversation. And he knows that it's not with the friends. So hopefully it's with, uh, with Elihu. Then Elihu says in verse 4, Be assured that my words are not false. One perfect in knowledge is with you. You go like, oh, wait. If your knowledge is from afar, then how, how, is, your, how is your knowledge perfect? Also, if you're a human being, somebody who's affected by sin, how is your knowledge perfect? And that's what really what I, what I want to get into, is uh, Elihu is making a very grandiose statement. And if you have, let's say, a pastoral counseling session, and you've just gotten to the point where this person is trusting you, and then you start saying things like, well, I know everything, and I, you can... I can tell you exactly what's supposed to happen and exactly where you're on and blah, blah, blah. Well, well, the person who's being counseled will now start drifting away because <laughs> this person is not acting as, as somebody who's um, understanding, but someone who's kind of overbearing, uh, trying to tell them that uh, how, they're, how they're not right, but not actually necessarily helping them fix it, just, just pointing out the problem. So when we're actually looking into verse verse 4 here, I think it's important that we try to try really try to understand what Elihu is saying, because if, if Elihu is really overstepping his bounds, even with this just one verse, then he's kind of jeopardizing his entire argument. Because if you say um, one wrong thing in a counseling session, or if you're saying one wrong thing when you're trying to comfort anyone, um, this can be held against you, whether or not you, you, you meant it that way. And really, that's kind of how it happened with uh, the early part of the book of Job, where the friends, when they started up, they were saying something not quite right, or at least non-sympathetic to Job. And um, Job kind of viewed this as more of an attack on, the, on behalf of the friends than something right. Um, because what was actually said by Eliphaz, and this is in chapter 4, where Eliphaz was saying, well, look to your works, what have you done? Therefore, you should be rewarded by God. And Job knows that he's done good works, but he's not rewarded by God. He's in a, sincere, a, 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 a severe state of suffering. So what does that mean for him? 
and Eliphaz can't really give an answer, and, and, and none of the friends really do. And then you get into a whole kerfuffle between, between Job and the friends after that. So uh, misplaced words at crucial times can, can lead to severe consequences in the dialogue. And Job was not helped by the friends. And in fact, the friends made things far worse because Job was now not even, was less seeking God at the end, more so than trying to focus on his own righteousness, that, that uh, he, was, he was good and perfect in how he was living his life, therefore God should be uh, um, rewarding him, not, not uh, letting, allowing him to suffer. Which is not the, the best way to go about uh, thinking about these things. Because the, pe the people who are experiencing all this suffering, well, is it because of their wicked deeds? Well, no, not necessarily. Like, it, I, I won't withhold the possibility that, yeah, sure, maybe God is afflicting you for some sort of sin. But uh, really, if you were forgiven in Christ, as Job was forgiven because by Christ, through, by way of the sacrifices, Old Testament sacrifices, then you have no sins left to be punished for. I mean, you're completely forgiven in Christ. This, this is what Christ does for us, is that he completely takes away all punishment for our sins. So because of Christ, we are completely perfect before our Lord. There's nothing left to be punished, nothing left to be uh, ruled against us. So, when, so if you're in the faith, if you're forgiven in Jesus Christ our Lord, you will stand on the judgment throne. If, you're, if your life is taken from you right now and you find yourself on the last day uh, before the judgment, uh, judgment throne of God, and he will see that you are completely forgiven, that there is nothing that you have left to pay in terms of punishment. This is a glorious promise given to us, but it can be very confusing when we actually experience hardships in this world. So the ultimate conclusion that we come to is that although these things are allowed by God and we don't know exactly why he allows certain things to occur, these things are not from God himself in the sense that he's not punishing us. He's allowing them to occur, but he's not trying to punish us for our sins. And a lot of the time, it's just the world uh, acting on its own, and God is just allowing it to act on its own. So uh, Job, was, Job was afflicted by Satan, acting on his own, because Satan was just opened up, was allowed to uh, attack Job. God said that uh, Satan, could, Satan could go to Job, and Satan, left over to the desires of his own heart, acted in sin against Job. So if God allows things in this world to act on their own, inevitably these will go the way of sin, the way of evil. So we don't exactly know why God allows some of these things to occur, and when we see him, we can definitely ask him. But it's not because God is punishing us. Our, our punishment has been swallowed up in, in Christ's sacrifice at the cross. We, he has taken all our sins from us, all our guilt, so we have nothing left to pay. We are completely forgiven. So we have no fear about our salvation but we do tend to get concerned about things of this world because things of this world can still be very horrible against us. So, um, Elihu speaking about his perfect knowledge, this might be the thing that destroys Elihu's relationship with Job. Uh, Elihu's, sorry, Job's friendship with the friends that has been jeopardized by what all they say, so now uh, Elihu's relationship with Job can also be compromised. But I think this is why it's important to really get at what Elihu's really saying, because um, he, he's probably not going to try and mean it the way that, he, that it sounds. <laughs> Does that really matter with some counseling sessions? Well, no, because some people will just hear it the way that they think that they're hearing it, and they'll just hold it against you. But um, what's Elihu really trying to say? And he's saying, uh, one who is perfect in knowledge is with you. And when I'm looking at the original, the original Hebrew, uh, the issue is more over the word perfect there. So what, what does Elihu actually mean by perfect? Well, it's to mime, to mime. And more often than not, it's translated, or it can be understood as blameless or without defect. 
And you could say, well, yeah, well, that means perfect. Well, I guess so, but perfect tends to mean something a little bit different in English, that perfect is um, the best you can possibly be. Like there's, you, yeah, yeah, you could say there's no flaw with it, which is part of being blameless and without defect. But for English, it's kind of, well, I'm the best that there's, that's possible. What I who's really trying to say is that when he's actually delivering a speech to Job, that he's not making any errors. And that's why he's also saying in the half verse right before that, in verse, so verse 4a in chapter 36, be sure that my words are not false. Because Elihu is basically saying that his words are without error. It, it's perfect in the sense that it's without defect, without flaw, but it's not perfect in the sense that Elihu knows absolutely everything. It's not perfect in the sense that Elihu is, is the pinnacle of uh, human thought. Elihu's not making that, that statement. What he's actually saying is uh, everything he's saying is without error. Uh, this, everything that falls is, is good in how it's rolled out because he's, he hasn't made any mistakes in thought. So that's less severe. And Job, actually knowing the language, uh, would be better able to, uh, to understand that this is Elihu's point, that Elihu's not trying to say that he's the, the pinnacle of human in knowledge, but that Elihu is actually trying to say uh, he's not making errors in his speech. So Job, if Job understands, well, what's going on, uh, or, or understands God and has the same uh, origin of knowledge as Elihu has, so, and this is going back to chapter 33, Elihu says that he's made by God, so he's from the Spirit of God. He was made from the earth, so he's of clay. And that uh, uh, there's no need to fear because he and Job are equals. Well, then Job can just rely on that, that, yeah, we're both from God. We're both created by God into this world. We're, we're both made from very earthy materials. And we're, we're on an equal playing field. So Job can actually look to that and say, well, okay, yeah, I know this. And if they're on equal playing field, well then, presumably they would also have the same uh, amount of knowledge about what's gone on before. The, and as I was saying beforehand, this would be roughly uh, the subject matter of Genesis chapters 1 through uh, 32. However, uh, again, Genesis had not been written at this point, so you would get a whole bunch of allusions to all the subject matter, but not necessarily direct quotations. So <clears throat> you can really see, well, what's going on with what's, uh, what Elihu is trying to get at is, well, we both have access to the same thing. So Job should be able to look at everything that Elihu is saying and be able to verify this thing. Yeah, this is good. And that's Elihu's point, really, is that uh, his words are not false and Job should be able to know that they're not false. Job can actually compare these things to what has gone before, so Job knows that this is all true. Um, and this is going to be different than the friends in the sense that the friends were trying to make Job, uh, or at least force Job into some conclusions um, related to, to Job's current state, and Elihu's not trying to do that. Elihu's not trying to force certain conclusions. What he's really trying to do is defend God, not, not try to defend Job, which ended up being what the friends were trying to do. And when Job was resistant to this type of thing, uh, they just assumed Job is indefensible and that he's actually guilty. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, if you're also looking at Elihu's, well, we can definitely misunderstand Elihu. Job could definitely... Uh, misunderstand Elihu, because, well, the, with the word to mime actually comes up a couple different places in, in the book of Job, and only, only two other places. One is actually from Job's own speech in, in Job chapter 12. And um, um, he's saying that he himself is... Righteous and blameless, that is, uh, uh, to me, perfect. And this is chapter 12, verse 4. So Job is saying, well, I'm perfect in a sense, perfect in, in righteousness. So there's no defect in his conduct. 
Um, so if that word has only come up once before and Elihu is making reference to that word, then Elihu is also trying to say, well, I'm again the same as you. <laughs> uh, if you think that you're perfectly right in your understanding and your righteousness here, well, then you should be able to verify what I'm saying. But we're also looking for it. <laughs> Elihu in his own in his own speech here. So his own speech is chapters 36, 37. He will say in verse 16, Do you know, speaking Job, do you know how the clouds hang poised, those wonders of him, God, who is perfect in knowledge? So the actual phrase perfect in knowledge comes up again, and Elihu is speaking specifically about God there. So uh, God is perfect in knowledge, he is without error. So if um, and the implication will be if Job can agree with, with Elihu, because Job is perfect in his righteousness and he can verify that Elihu is speaking rightly about everything, then Job will also be able to trust God and know that God and how God conducts the universe, such as, as Elihu will say in, in, in the natural revelation in, in the world, be able to hang clouds. Uh, that Job will also be able to conclude that God is... Uh, perfect, complete, blameless in, in his actions. So really, Elihu's goal is not to try and elevate himself, but redirect Job from, from Job's own person, because Job has said that he's blameless, so that he can actually trust Elihu to actually speak rightly, and then from there get to God is able to act rightly. Uh, act rightly within creation as one who is perfect in knowledge. So if Job trusts in himself, then you should also be trusting in God. And God is the one who's acting perfectly righteously. So Job, although he does have legitimate complaints about his own state of suffering, he can still trust that God is perfect and will work all things out to his own purpose. Uh, the issue with Job, as with uh, most, well, sorry, now, I guess we say most people struggling with uh, various hardships in the faith. They're just wondering, how does all this work out with the good and perfect God that, that I am in a state of suffering uh, in this world? And really, it boils down to, as, as we would say, if we're looking towards righteousness, perfection, um, justice, wisdom, it boils down to God himself, that how does God act? If he's actually acting in this world, if he's actually setting the standard for this world, then we know that he's actually going to correct all things in the end. He gives us this promise, uh, especially in Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom he actually makes the perfect corrections, making us perfect in God's sight. So it's not that we are the best, but that we are made blameless in God's sight, that our guilt is taken away and placed on Christ, and that we are forgiven in God's sight. So... <clears throat> If we're talking about our own righteousness, our own state of blamelessness, we really can only find that coming from Jesus Christ because God himself is the only one who's truly righteous. So rather than focusing on our own righteousness, our own perfection in knowledge, if we do get any knowledge whatsoever, as, as Elihu is saying in his own speech, verse 33, uh, sorry, verse 3 in chapter 36, I get my knowledge from afar, I will ascribe justice to my maker. Elihu is saying that he's not perfect in knowledge of himself, but that this must stem from God. If Job is perfect of himself, this must stem from God. If anyone in this world is suffering, but still know that they are perfect in Jesus Christ our Lord, they are perfect because this comes from God. They are not suffering because of their evils, they are suffering unjustly in this world, and God, as one who is perfect, as one who is righteous, as one who is blameless, will correct this in times to come. Amen. Let us continue. Page 284 with the noon prayer. Gracious Jesus, our Lord and our God, at this hour you bore our sins in your own body on the tree, so that we, being dead to sin, might live unto righteousness. Have mercy upon us now and at the hour of our death, and grant to us, your servants, with all others who devoutly remember your blessed passion, a holy and peaceful life in this world, and through your grace, eternal glory in the life to come, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. O Lord God, help us when we are confronted with our own sinfulness and with any other errors on our part. Help us, O Lord, in our in our guilt and also in our in our incompleteness, that you might comfort us and that you might guide us into ways of everlasting life and, and paradise. Help us, O Lord, to be comfortable with our frustrations in this world, that we might trust you through these things, and that we may not uh, be lost over to looking at the errors of the world, whether um, moral errors, uh, being seeing the unrighteousness of the existence, or in the errors of uh, things not measuring up to the standard you set of creation, the, the way things are supposed to work. Uh, help us, O oh Lord, to to be at peace with these things, to be patient with these things, and when we're confronted with the horrors of this world, that you would uh, grant us peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, that we might still hold on to the hope of, of, of paradise in him. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.